Hello all. So in the last part, we were witnessing the meeting of two sets of bards and their troops. One was already impoverished and was seeking guidance, while just in time, the other set of bards reached there. We shall continue with the poem and see what happens further. Pale Yarlin Varunani Kulapu Vali Anna Kavadupada Battal Vilaku Alal Uruvin Visi Uru Pachai Ya Yelanjol Seyol Abba Yitru Aidu Mayer Orihi a Totram Pola Pullam Putti a Pudi Uru Porway Aleva Lalavan Kan Kandana Tuleva Ituranda Turapu Amai Ani Yenal Tingal Vadivitru Agi Anna Villa Ami Varu Varuai Pambanandana Ungir Marupin Mayol Munkai Ai Tudikadukum Kankurirkai Tin Pinitivavin Ai Tinayasi Avail Anna Vaivai Pogi a Viral Ular Narambin Kailvi Pogi a Nil Visi Todayel Madam Kamal Madare Mani Anna Adangami Nindra Amaivar Kachi Arale Kalver Padevidarulin Marutalai Payerkum Maruvin Pale we are going to get a description of the Palai Yarl. Yarl refers to a lute or a harp that the bards carried along with them. It is a stringed instrument and the poet is going to give us a detailed description of how the large lute looks like. The classy harp. Split into like a stag's hoof. Flame tinge stretched leather proof. Much like an early baby bump of a dame, coated with delicate and fine hair, same, covered and fastened like a lid so firm, with tiny holes like gaping crabby eyes, shiny nails driven in tight and nice, shaped like the moon's eighth crescent, the mouth sans tongue present, the stem raised like cobra's hood, like bracelets in the dainty dark wrists, those tightly tight frets. Not even a millet grain sized ground, sans error as fingers drum form, still wound tight after the strum stops, composed like a newly wed dame, and stood like a goddess in all her fame. Even coarser bandits' hearts do melt as those strings on her reverberate. Here, the poet. That is, the bard who has already met King Karigalin happens to see that the impoverished bards carry a large lute. Lutes are harps, are stringed instruments. There were varieties of harps available during the ancient times, and mostly they were named after their sizes, shapes, or the place of origin. And in this case, it is a Pali yard. Pali refers to desert. And yarl, of course, is loot. So it is a loot made of wood available in the deserts. And this Pale yarl has got 21 strings. And because of its huge size, it is also called a peri yarl. Peri means big, and yarl, of course, is loot. So it's either a peri yarl or a Pale yarl. And this huge instrument is carried by the impoverished bards. So, how does it actually look like? The poet notices that uh, the drum of the harp, now this yarl is somewhat similar in shape and size to that of a veena. Now, if you will recollect, a veena has a pear shaped drum, it has a long bridge, and there is a spherical drum connected on the other end. And often, veenas have got the tip curved, shaped like a yarly, a mythological creature. Whereas the yarl, has a larger pear shaped drum, it is a curved bridge, and at the end of the bridge, usually the bards used to tie feathers of peacocks just for decoration. One difference between a veena and a yarl, especially a peri yarl, is that the yarl doubled as a peri guy, a drum, rather a war drum, while the veena's pear shaped drum is completely made of wood. A peri yarl has its bottom made of wood, whereas it is covered, stretched with newly tanned leather. And on this piece of leather, the strings that are connected to the bridge are actually connected. 
how many strings do we have we have 21 strings because of its huge size of course it is called the periyar and it is made of wood got from deserts and hence it is called palayar also the poet compares the newly tanned leather with its fine delicate hair to that of the belly of a pregnant woman the baby bump uh, at an early stage will look very beautiful and often the baby bump would be covered with small delicate hair so the poet is reminded of a baby bump of a woman uh, when he sees the periyar's drum and he takes a look at the knobs that are connecting uh, the bridge and the string he compares the knobs with the eyes of crabs that he has seen on seashore if you had been to the beach you might have seen small crabs strutting across and their eyes are compared to the knobs on the large lute but several descriptions like this even compares the bridge to that of the raised hood of a cobra he says it is so curved and at the end when it opens its hood it looks exactly like a cobra that is standing in full length curved shape so there is a beautiful description given by the poet about the palayar when talking about the music that it produces the poet says that despite its huge size the yar produces the most melodious tunes of all instruments and he says that even a person who is very very crude even a bandit a robber will feel his heart melting when he listens to the music that flows from the palayar so what else has the poet observed we shall move ahead with the poem yale vasikum murai variyum vadithum undiyum murandum சீருடை நன்மொழி நீரோடு சிதறி ஸ்ட்ரம் த ஸ்ட்ரிங்ஸ் ஸோ ஸ்ட்ரோக் அண்ட் ஸ்ட்ரம் அண்ட் பிளக் தோ ஸ்ட்ரிங்ஸ் டு பென் த மெலுஃபுளுவ சிம்பனி ஆஸ் நேச்சர் சிங்ஸ் நோ தெர் ஆர் டிஃப்ரெண்ட் டைப்ஸ் ஆஃப் யார்ட்ஸ் அவைலபிள் அண்ட் ஆஸ் ஐ டோல்ட் ஆல்ரெடி இட் இஸ் மோஸ்ட்லி பேஸ்ட் ஆன் த சைஸ் ஷேப் ஆர் த பிளேஸ் ஆஃப் ஆரிஜின் வேர் எஸ் த ஸ்ட்ரிங்ஸ் ஆர் ஆல் மேட் ஆஃப் மெட்டல் now these strings all produce similar sounds but because of the size and shape of the yards they may reverberate more or less for example the periyar produces a very resonating sound but a seriyal seriyal refers to a smaller lute which is very very small in size compact very compact to hold it produces a very sharp note so the poet says that there are different types to play different methods to play a lute one can either stroke the strings mildly or just strum it or pluck those strings severely to produce booming sounds or sometimes they even bend the string and release it suddenly so that a deeper note will be produced so he explains how bards usually play the large lute the poet moves his eyes from over the lute to somebody else who is standing near the chief of the bard who is it well it's going to be a gift for ice paadinin varunane aral pol koondal pirai pol tirunudal kolai vil puruvattu kolungadai malikan ilavidal puraiyum inmoli thuvar vai pala uru muttin palithir venpal mayir kurai karuvi maan kadaiyanna poongulai oosal porai sal kaadin நாணடை சாய்ந்த நலங்கிளர் எருத்தின் ஆடு அமை பனை தோல் அரிமயிர் முன்கை நெடுவரை மிசையிய காந்தல் மெல்விரல் கிளிவாய் ஒப்பின் ஒளிவிடு வல் உகிர் அணங்கின உறுத்த சுனங்கணி ஆகத்து ஈர்க்கிடை போகா ஏரிழ வனமுலை நீர்பெயர் சுழியின் நிறைந்த கொப்புள் உண்டென உணரா உயவும் நடுவின் வண்டு இருப்பு அன்னபல் கால் அல்குல் இரும்பிடி தடக்கையின் செறிந்து திரள் குரங்கின் பொருந்து மயிரொழுகிய திறந்து தாட்கு ஒப்ப வருந்து நாய் நாவின் பெருந்தரு சீரடி அறக்கு உருக்கு அன்ன சென்னிலன் ஒதுங்கலின் பரல் பகை உழந்த நோயொடு சிவனி மரல் பழுத்தன்ன மருகு நீர் மொக்குள் நண்பகல் அந்தி நடையிடை விலங்கிலின் பிடை மயில் உருவின் பெருந்தொகு பாடினி 
the bewitching balladeer the poet notices that the bard's troop has only one woman and it's all men and she is the wife of the chief of the impoverished bard troop she is very beautiful to look at and the poet is unable to stop himself from describing her beauty the bewitching balladeer voluminous groves of tresses crescently bowed forehead killer bow bros compassionate beady eye the perfect ridge over juicy scarlet lips that never lie that hold cursedly cute pearly teeth the scissory lock along her ear feathery danglers swinging from their swelled neck bent of coyness and fair sturdy bamboo like arms with fine delicate hair slender long fingers like flame lilies sharp beak like painted finger nails deep cleave where courage fails cavesh is press pressed against each other and full like unfathomed whirlpool the novel navel that invisibly slim waist in the mid the sweet venus mount inviting buzzing bees set on thick and strong thighs wave with ease smooth furry hair shapely pedicle no tender feet like wet dry tongue of a tired mongrel melt like pinkish wax on scorching sand and on malicious pebbles strewn on the soil that causes such painful ripe boil walk not during the steaming day thou bewitchingly beautiful pea fowl like balladeer the poet here says how beautiful the woman is to look at she has perfect features and anybody will understand that she has been suffering a lot because her feet are full of blisters the woman has beautiful forehead she has beady eyes sharp eyebrows and her neck is bent out of shyness she feels shy because she is meeting a group of strangers that is typical of any woman and he says that looking at the poor woman's feet it feels as if they are very delicate like the dry tongue of a very tired dog and it's full of boils because they have made her walk under hot sun there are no shades because all the trees are bare it is the peak of summer so obviously there are no leaves in sight that can produce any shade this woman poor woman has walked over pebbles burning soil and her feet are ready to bleed so he says that the bard should not have traveled under hot sun they should have waited until the sun set and then could have traveled further because the poor woman was suffering we have met our beauty and we have met our impoverished bards what else is the poet going to tell them more we shall look into it in the next part thank you